And we're very happy to have you along on this Remembrance Day, the 11th of November, 2007. And very happy to welcome one of our more popular experts here at CFON 1410 AM. His resume includes heading up the Faculty of Child Psychology at the University of Ottawa before lecturing in psychiatry at Harvard for seven years. And now he's in Vancouver and become one of the leaders in the field of biofeedback and neurotherapy, the medical science of adjusting brain waves. And we're very lucky to have him in Vancouver and answering your questions live today. It's Dr. Paul Swingle, and it's all in your head. Hello, Good sir. Morning. Nice to have you along again. Uh, this being Remembrance Day, and before we get into our, our main subject today, uh, you've worked with a lot of war veterans, uh, both Vietnam and, and throughout your career. Um, let's talk a little bit about post-traumatic stress and some of the, you know, the casualties with the brain involved in combat. Yes. That's particularly relevant <clears throat> to the topic we're talking about today, age-related declines. Uh, and I've treated a lot of veterans uh, in my career, <clears throat> and there are two things in particular that implicate age-related declines. Uh, the first, of course, are head injuries. Uh, and sometimes the head injury, uh, the problems associated with head injury manifest as we get older, and it is cumulative. So we have some of those issues. The other, however, is uh, the effects of traumatic stress. Uh, traumatic stress has an impact uh, on people immediately following the uh, event, of course, but it takes a toll over time, <clears throat> and it uh, increases some of the age-related dec uh, declines, such as dementias and certainly depression. Uh, that's one of, the, one of the reasons why it's very important to deal with traumatic stress as soon as possible to minimize some of these longer-term effects. But that's certainly one of the relevant issues associated with the treatment of our veterans. We, uh, we, we hear even about the kids today that are suffering terribly with depression uh, coming back overseas, so it's a huge, huge problem. We are talking about age-related decline today, and we welcome your telephone calls at 280-CFUN, 280-2386, a star 1410 if you're uh, driving around on this Remembrance Day. And uh, in today's program, you're going to find out one of the most costly and prevalent health problems to um, strike seniors, and it's not hip replacement surgeries. It's not what you think. Uh, you'll be very surprised, and Dr. Swingle uh, certainly treats this particular problem and uh, we'll talk uh, a lot about uh, the difference between just memory loss and perhaps dementia and uh, even some tips you can have at home, uh, diet and exercise tips to help uh, stop the onset of dementia. First of all, let's talk a little bit about neurotherapy. I know you're here every month and uh, we do this show regularly and you've been here for quite a while now, but there are still lots of people who haven't heard of neurotherapy, what it is and, uh, and why it's so successful, but it's been around for like four decades. That's correct. <clears throat> The whole concept of changing symptoms by changing the physiology associated with it goes back about 40 or 50 years now. Uh, at Columbia University in the 60s, Neil Miller demonstrated that rats could control their own heart rate and blood pressure. Uh, and around the same time, Dr. Sturman at UCLA demonstrated that cats could control their own brain activity, brain waves. Uh, and it just made sense that uh, if you can find a brain irregularity associated with a symptom such as depression, for example, if you were able to normalize that brain activity <laughs> or physiological activity, that the symptom would abate, the symptom would uh, uh, disappear. And that's exactly what happens. So in neurotherapy, what we do is we look for irregularities in the way the brain's processing information. As you know, I don't ask people why they come to see me. Uh, I do a brain assessment and tell them why they're sitting there. Uh, that's how precise <clears throat> the diagnostic properties of neurotherapy are, but more importantly, it gives us our window of opportunity for treating these conditions. So we do a brain assessment and find these areas of irregularity, and then we have a number of ways of <clears throat> normalizing that uh, brain activity. <clears throat> Neurofeedback is the more common one, uh, and, and there we set it up so that when the brain is doing what we want it to do, the person hears a tone or sees something move on the computer screen. If it's a child, we set it up so they're playing a video, ga <clears throat> video game with their brain. 
and uh, that helps to normalize brain activity. And then we have some other techniques that have been developed primarily in my clinics, uh, brain driving. There we measure a particular aspect of brain function, and based on that measurement, we stimulate with light sound. For adults, we uh, might use uh, microamperage stimulation, EMF fields, and so forth to nudge the brain into more normal functional ranges. Third class of treatments are things that we suggest that people do at home, <clears throat> certain kinds of cognitive exercises or listening to harmonics, uh, you know, sounds and so forth, to stabilize and uh, further improve the uh, brain ch uh, changes. On the physiological side, uh, we set it up so that the person can monitor their own muscle tension or blood flow and uh, make use of that information to learn how to regularize the physiological uh, responses in the body and the symptoms associated with irregularities are treated and corrected in that fashion. He's Dr. Paul Swingle. This is It's All in Your Head on CFUN 1410 AM as we discuss neurotherapy, biofeedback, and age-related decline on this Remembrance Day 2007. Uh, Dr. Swingle's clinic is on Melville Street in downtown Vancouver. Dunsmuir becomes Melville. And his telephone number there is 608-0444, 608-0444. And uh, every week uh, when we do this show, I uh, every month that is, I go to the website and just uh, read the website and all the great resources on there. You could do the same at swingleandassociates.com, www.swingleandassociates.com. And Swingle is spelled swing, L-E. If you want to Google or just go to the website, there's lots of great information, uh, Q&A, frequently asked questions, and uh, whether or not neurotherapy may be right for you. So with age-related decline, doctor, uh, obviously uh, this is a, an interesting time with baby boomers now starting to get a little older, and, mm -hmm. and uh, we're going to see more and more of this. But uh, what's the difference between, what's the difference between uh, an age-related decline and perhaps uh, just memory loss? I mean, how do you know the difference between, say, uh, dementia and, and a memory issue? Uh, a memory decline is an age-related decline. <clears throat> and uh, basically, there are three areas of concern. One is a cognitive decline, and that can be dementia or uh, Alzheimer's. Now, uh, there is a dementia associated with Alzheimer's, of course, so we have two different forms of dementia there. Uh, the second thing uh, that we are concerned with uh, are things like uh, immune functioning in the elderly, and it can be an age-related decline, and that's also associated with uh, good uh, brain uh, f uh, health and functioning. And the third is urinary incontinence, or incontinence generally, but urinary incontinence is uh, one of the most serious and prevalent and costly problems uh, in dealing with the elderly. We're going to deal with that in depth and uh, all sorts of issues related to age-related decline. And you have some great suggestions on how to ward it off and uh, things you could do to keep yourself stimulated and, of course, treatment as well. And we're talking with Dr. Paul Swingle. Our telephone number here is 280-C-FUN, 280-2386. Star 1410 on your cell phone if you have a question about somebody you love or perhaps it's you and you notice some changes in your mood, behavior, uh, your ability to do things, uh, we'd love to help you. And because uh, Dr. Swingle is here live, you can ask him yourself. 280-C-FUN, 280 star 1410 on the cell phone. And we'll have more with Dr. Paul Swingle. It's All in Your Head continues next on CFUN 1410 AM. And welcome back to Experts on Call, CFUN 1410 AM. It's Peter Shad along with Dr. Paul Swingle as we talk about age-related decline. How many uh, North Americans roughly suffer from, uh, from problems with, uh, with the aged, if you will? Well, <clears throat> just taking dementia, for example, uh, if we're looking at people 70 years and above, uh, almost 14% to have dementia of some form. So that's huge. That's one in seven. And of that 14%, about 10%, uh, uh, the dementia is Alzheimer's form of dementia. When you get up into the range of about 90 years of age, then almost 40% of people have dementia. Wow. <clears throat> now, the interesting thing about neurotherapy is that 
uh, non-Alzheimer's dementia can absolutely be prevented uh, if you uh, deal with uh, making the brain more efficient. There's a very particular waveform associated with uh, age-related decline. It's uh, actually the uh, alpha frequencies, and uh, it's very easy to see when you do a brain map. And <clears throat> as we get older, our alpha frequencies uh, decline in speed is basically what it is. And if we can keep the speed of the alpha uh, wave band uh, high, then it absolutely prevents these forms of dementias, and it correlates very highly with good immune functioning as well. Now, there's a lot of research behind that, uh, those statements. At the University of Salzburg, uh, people like Doppelmayr and some of the other people over there have done a lot of research on looking at specifically the alpha frequencies and dementias and IQ and uh, good immune functioning. Uh, so we have very firm... Uh, data on these things. We also uh, want to make sure we talk a little bit later on about the difference between dementia and potentially depression being misdiagnosed because that's common as well. That's a huge problem, yes. 280 CFUN is our number, 280 2386, as we welcome Nancy to the show. Hey, Nancy, thanks for waiting. You're on with Dr. Paul Swingle on CFUN 1410 AM. Hi there, thank you. Um, I'm calling regarding my mother who's uh, just turned 81. In the last couple of years, we've noticed a lot more suspicion and paranoia. She's changed her locks on her place, on her condo numerous times. She says people come in and, and take things like her bath mat. They changed the towel rack in her bathroom, uh, you know, changed one white jacket she had for another, that kind of thing. Is that is that dementia or? Yes, and it, it very likely is associated with uh, Alzheimer's. Uh, you get a lot of suspicious behavior very frequently, and a lot of that is because people uh, lose their sense of security. They don't recognize people, <clears throat> somebody who may be the uh, caretaker in their place, for example. Uh, if they have a good, warm relationship or, you know, a, a acquaintance with this individual, they're not frightened. But if they, they can't quite recall who this person is, then uh, there are more and more strangers around them and uh, suspicious, paranoid-like behavior starts to uh, manifest. Well, she's very, I mean, she's very physically healthy. She, I mean, she lives on her own. She's completely capable of living on her own physically. She golfs in the summer. She golfs probably three, four times a week. Mm -hmm. She does Pilates now. She paints. You know, she's very active, and she has many friends. She doesn't have a caregiver, but um, she's just becoming more and more... It's very hard to deal with because if you if you doubt her at all, she gets very angry. Yes. Like I'll say, a mom, who, who would measure your towel rack and come in and put a you know a cheaper in her version towel rack in your bathroom, and she gets very angry. You know why you don't believe me? And it's very difficult to deal with. But uh, not uncommon. No, yeah. no, we get a lot of these kinds of things. And the problem in that kind of situation is uh, these individuals are very often not. Uh, uh, available for treatment, uh, you know, they would feel that coming for treatment is uh, 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 more of the same. That is, uh, somebody trying to control, manipulate them, you know, that sort of thing. And it's very difficult to uh, persuade these individuals that, uh, you know, their suspicions are not correct. Yeah. The bottom line there uh, really is to <clears throat> try to have uh, age-appropriate uh, uh, colleagues uh, come in and uh, uh, basically have a support group associated with it uh, in terms of trying to uh, uh, correct the perceptions. The problem with this kind of thing is uh, perception is a reality for these individuals. It doesn't matter whether it's not true or not. Whether it's true or not is irrelevant. It's uh, what they are experiencing and uh, feeling. The fundamental core to that is uh, fear and insecurity, by the way. Nancy, uh, I'm going to give you Dr. Swingle's telephone number here because uh, at least if you get uh, the brain mapping, then Dr. Swingle can tell exactly what the issue is, which is uh, his telephone number, 608-0444, 608-0444. Very welcoming environment. I could speak on that uh, with uh, firsthand experience. Uh, 604-608-0444. Uh, get a brain map done. You can get right to the core of the problem and hopefully... Uh, like Dr. Swingle said, the uh, peer group will help convince her that it will be a great thing to do. But she's doing everything else that you suggest, exercise, uh, doing Pilates. Mm -hmm. I mean, very active at 81. Uh, I remember uh, my aunt's 
uh, mother would leave her stove on. That, that's when mm-hmm. the alarm bell started to go off that it was time to, to get help. Thanks for your phone call, 280-CFUN, 280-2386. Nancy, let's go to Lynn now. Lynn, you're on with Dr. Paul Swingle on CFUN, 1410 AM. Hi. I'd like some information, please. I, a lot of doctors told me I suffer from anxiety, and I believe I do, but, and then they tell me, well, you know, I think it's depression. And then they put me on medication for depression, and um, I don't get along with any of them. I take them for a sexer. I took them for, for one or two days, and the next day my chest is all uh, nervous and really upset and I don't know what to do about that um, uh, like one doctor will say it's it's anxiety the other one will say it's depression and then they want me to, to not to take Ativan I take Ativan one a day for I don't know how long now 15 years or something sometimes I don't even take it and if I go cold turkey and I quit because sometimes I'm tired of taking this Ativan too they say, oh, you can't do that. You can't do that because, you know, it's um, it's going to ruin your system. You know, you have to do it very slowly. Half of them don't know what they're talking about. I really need your help, you know. Well, we see a lot of folks <clears throat> with uh, your kind of uh, complaints. Uh, but my guess is that we're dealing with an anxiety-based depression. And <clears throat> the problem with antidepressants is it can make the anxiety worse. Uh, the problems with uh, some of the uh, anti-anxiety medications is they have a sedating and addictive property associated with them. Uh, this is a perfect example of where a brain assessment is the first uh, order of business so we can tell exactly what is going on here because there are various uh, sites uh, in the brain that are associated dep- with depression and other sites associated with anxiety. When we correct those, the uh, person is medication-free. Lynn, uh, you, you talked about uh, where well, you feel that feeling in your chest. What, what, what kind of symptoms do you have? What kind of things do you feel? Well, you know, uh, I actually suffer from, I, I make a mountain out of a molehill. If there's a, a small problem to be solved, you know, I make it big. And so I, I realize that, and, and I, I do worry about what if, you know, like what if I go on a holiday, what if, because I'm on my own, and I, I always think of the worst. I just had knee surgery, so I, it was terrible getting the knee surgery because I was thinking, okay, what if my leg isn't going to move anymore? What if I'm going to get worse? Because I do see, I, my father died about a year ago, and I was at the hospital, one of the hospitals here in Vancouver, and they make so many mistakes, it's pathetic. And I was there 12 to 16 hours a day with my dad. You know, the nurses would give the wrong medication or they'd give too much. And if I wasn't watching, you know, like there would be so many mistakes made. And um, I, I just think, well, what if they're going to make these mistakes with me? You know, and when I go to one doctor and I change doctors, because sometimes I do, um, they, you know, some say, oh, you suffer from anxiety, and the other ones will say, no, you don't have anxiety, you have sad. It's the winter thing. Then they say, no. Oh, sorry, Lenny's still there? Sorry, go ahead. Yeah. But anyway, this, this is... I, I, All of this can be uh, determined by doing a brain assessment. <clears throat> All of the things that you've described are associated with very specific uh, inefficiencies in brain processing, all of which are correctable. And, you know, the good news, uh, Lynn, is uh, Dr. Swingle has talked about uh, these kind of issues before, and, and you refer to it as an easy, you know, solution. It's it's one of the easier problems you have when people come in with them. <clears throat> yes, uh, depression is a pretty straightforward uh, problem to uh, to deal with. Once you correct the brain inefficiency, then the uh, client feels a lot better. Thanks for your call, Lynn. I'm going to give you Dr. Swingle's clinic, and you can get uh, started on the road to knowing exactly what the issue is. 604-608-0444. That's 608-0444. You can go to his website, uh, Lynn, as well, uh, swingleandassociates.com. That's uh, swing, L-E, uh, swingleandassociates.com, and just read a little bit about what the clinic does and, and how he helps people. Uh, good phone calls so far on our program at 280C Fund, 280-2386. We'll take more, uh, one from Sherry coming up in just a second, as we continue with our topic today of age-related decline. One in seven North Americans has some form of a dementia as they get older. That's quite a staggering number. More with Dr. Paul Swingle. It's all in your head coming up next on C Fund 1410 AM. Discussing neurotherapy and biofeedback and how it can help with age-related decline. Uh, I mentioned before the break, uh, one in seven North Americans has some form of dementia. We want to 
talk a little bit later on about the difference between Alzheimer's and non-Alzheimer's type dementia because a lot of times people just naturally assume, uh-oh, it's Alzheimer's, you forgot something, you forgot my name. And uh, Dr. Swingle also has some great suggestions, diet and fitness-wise, to help uh, ward off some of those symptoms and keep your brain bright. And we'll talk about brain brightening as well for the agent. Let's take another phone call here at 280-C-FUND, 280-2386, as Dr. Swingle is live on this Remembrance Day. And Sherry wants to talk about uh, supranuclear palsy. Did I get that right, Sherry? Uh, it's progressive supranuclear palsy. How would you describe that? Well, what is that? It's a brain disease, um, and it affects the motor skills, and eventually um, the person can no longer um, swallow on their own, and uh, they usually die with um, asphyxiated pneumonia. Wow. Uh, Dr. Swingle, are you familiar with that? Uh? Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. <clears throat> the, there is some evidence to uh, indicate that we can delay that process. Now, with a lot of these, let me give you an example. Uh, there's a form of uh, epilepsy referred to as the Mediterranean form of uh, epilepsy, which is a progressive and potentially terminal disorder. N with neurotherapy, we have not been able to reverse that, but we've been able to stop the progression. And when we're dealing with some of these degenerative kinds of things, like Alzheimer's <clears throat> and the other motor disorders, uh, what it seems like we're able to do is to delay and slow down the progression of the uh, of the terminal aspect of that. Uh, in terms of reversing it, as far as I know, there's there's no uh, good evidence that we're able to reverse anything of that nature. But prevent, <laughs> even I, I I think prevents too strong a word uh, to uh, delay the uh, progressive uh, aspect of it. Certainly with Mediterranean forms, <clears throat> excuse me, Mediterranean forms of epilepsy, the evidence is pretty clear. We can arrest the uh, progression. Sherry, what stage is your mother at at the moment? Well, um, they usually give someone seven to ten years, and um, she is at the point where she no longer can walk. She's wheelchair-bound. Um, her eyes only look straight ahead. She doesn't have the ability to move up down to the sides. And her um, breathing is um, heavy, and she also has to, you know, be very careful when she swallows uh, liquids or solids and... Um, so they haven't really said, you know, if she's near the 10th year or whatever, but I feel that she has had this for more than 10 years. Hmm. Um, you know, the symptoms that we noticed in the beginning, which we thought were high blood pressure, was she would fall down. She would fall backwards a lot. And that, again, was one of the signs. Yes. But we didn't know for a long time. She was only diagnosed in January of this year. So she's been getting progressively worse and worse, and we just thought it was high blood pressure. We thought it was Alzheimer's or dementia, too, and, but now we know what it is. So I just wanted to know if, like you're saying, the doctor's treatment could um, maybe just kind of prolong it. it. It will not reverse it. I understand that. Yes, and there is, and we do a lot of peripheral biofeedback as well. Uh, for things like uh, swallowing problems, it may be too far along uh, to be able to do anything really marked with that, but that is another option. I would certainly start neurologically. I would start with the brain and see if there are slowing uh, in the, if there's a, a neurological slowing over the motor cortex. And if that's the case, then what I would recommend is that we do some procedures to increase the uh, speed of the brain activity over those regions and just see if we get any changes in range of motion, things of that nature. We would have one of our physio folks uh, monitor to see whether we're getting any changes in strength and so forth. Dr. Swingle's uh, clinic number is uh, 6080444, Sherry. That's 6080444. It's Dr. Swingle. 
Swingle and Associates, swingleandassociates.com, if you want to check out the website and get more information. It has a, a wealth of information for you to, to look up on. You're listening to It's All in Your Head with Dr. Paul Swingle, live here on Remembrance Day at CFUN 1410 AM. Our number is 280-CFUN, 280-2386, or if you're driving around today, star 1410. We mentioned off the top of the show, Doctor, that uh, and you re- re- referenced it briefly, that the most costly uh, and prevalent health care problem with uh, with some of the aged is, is incontinence. And that is surprising to me because... Uh, I would have thought it was things like uh, broken hips and, uh, you know, falls and, and that kind of the thing. But, mm-hmm. I mean, this is a huge issue, and you actually deal with this in several different kind of ways. That's right, yes. Uh, yes, uh, urinary incontinence is one of the most costly and prevalent uh, health problems with the elderly. <clears throat> uh, it's such a uh, an issue that uh, the nursing profession actually has a journal uh, referred to as urologic nursing, uh, which gives you an idea of you know how severe this problem is. The basic issue with urinary incontinence is the strength of the pelvic floor muscle. And what we do is we strengthen the uh, pelvic floor muscle and make it independent of the abdominal muscles, which is what the problem is in urinary incontinence. Uh, there's a lot of research on this, and the success rates are extremely impressive. <clears throat> and all uh, people who deal with the elderly strongly recommend that you start with <clears throat> very uh, simple uh, interventions and avoid the, the more invasive, uh, dangerous ones. The last thing on the planet you want to do is uh, surgery in this regard. Uh, the, uh, as I said, the prevalence of this is very high. <clears throat> In addition to doing peripheral uh, biofeedback on uh, the musculature of the abdomen and the uh, uh, pelvic floor muscles, we also strengthen a waveform associated with uh, motor uh, strength, and that's a brainwave referred to as the sensory motor rhythm. So it's a combination of uh, strengthening the pelvic floor muscles and then also a a, a neurotherapy related. That's right. And then we give uh, some home exercises to uh, not only strengthen but sustain and maintain the strength of the pelvic floor. The uh, success rate, as I said, is quite impressive with this. And you said that, uh, for example, Kegel exercises is one of the ones that, that you'd recommend? Yes, uh, as a method for sustaining the gains. Uh, Kegel is uh, uh, not as effective as some of the techniques we use for strengthening the uh, pelvic floor muscle. We're talking about age-related decline here on It's All in Your Head with Dr. Paul Swingle. Our telephone number is 280-CFUN, 280-2386, star 1410 on the cell as we welcome Candy to the show. Hi, Candy. Thanks for waiting. You're on with Dr. Paul Swingle. It's all in your head. Hi, uh, my favorite show, actually, on CFUN. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm wondering, Dr. Swingle, um, about the definition of accuracy with your procedures uh, when it comes to trauma. Yes. Like, for instance, can you actually tell the difference? Can you depict the difference between a sexual abuse or a physical abuse, or is it more of a suspicion? And would your procedure be able to expose situations? That's why she's one of our favorite listeners, by the way, too. Those kind of questions. <laughs> <clears throat> what we see on the brain maps when there's trauma is a suppression of a waveform. It does not tell us what the nature of the abuse is likely to have been. Um, but what we're concerned with here is, is the brain registering that a trauma has not been adequately processed. That's really what it amounts to. The brain's trying to protect itself against the emotional impact of the trauma. Uh, So there's a suppression of a waveform. Now, unfortunately, that suppression of that waveform affects creativity. It affects memory. It affects a lot of things. So it's the... uh, areas related to the non uh, the inefficient processing of the trauma that causes the difficulty. Now, there are a couple of exceptions uh, in terms of what the brain tells us about the conditions under which the trauma is likely to have taken place. And there's a pattern that I see 
uh, in brain activity associated with trauma. And if I see that pattern, uh, I'm willing to to venture a, a 25 cent bet that uh, this person was uh, uh, in some way traumatized when they were asleep, uh, because the sleep wave is affected in addition to the trauma wave, and. Uh, just to give you a, a recent example, I saw this pattern. I asked the, the uh, it happened to be a female. I said, "Were you attacked when you were asleep?" And her jaw dropped to her uh, to the floor. How could I possibly know that? Well, the reason I ventured that probe was because I saw the trauma signature and I saw that there was a vigilance response in the in the uh, sleep wave when we triggered the trauma, which suggested to me what happened was uh, she was raped and she was attacked when she was asleep and, you know, uh, that kind of startle response. So that's how precise, I mean, your measurements can be and how much you can see. Great question, Candy. Mm-hmm. Thanks for listening as always. Brilliant. Thank you. Now, of course, you're a full-service uh, clinic. It's not just about neurotherapy and biofeedback. You have psychologists, psychiatrists. You have the whole gamut there. So, I mean, that's part of the whole, you know, the reason why people go to your clinic is for that full-service type uh, treatment. It's very rare that a person has a single problem. <laughs> so, for example, uh, the topic that we're dealing with today is a good example. An elderly person may come in. And a family member may have brought them in because they're concerned about dementia. Now, the question is, is it dementia or is it depression or is it both? Because depression can mimic dementia. The person is apathetic. You know, they're not paying attention. So it sounds like their memory (coughs) is bad. Uh, They're uh, lethargic. They're not interested in anything. (coughs) So the family member is suspicious of uh, dementia. They may also have an incontinence problem, and they may have a sleep problem. So, I mean, we're dealing with this uh, range of of difficulties. So you really need uh, a situation in which you can deal with, you know, the the whole array of symptoms. And we have a large number of people that we refer to. If it looks like a peculiar kind of allergy, for example, is a physician that we work with who does testing on some of these unusual allergies, etc. Wow. Uh, 280-CFUN is our number, 280-2386. And when we continue here with It's All in Your Head with Dr. Paul Swingle from Swingle and Associates, we'll talk about uh, Alzheimer's a little bit and uh, how you can tell the difference between Alzheimer's and just uh, dementia or perhaps depression. And we'll talk about some of the things that you can do at home uh, and help uh, some of your elderly colleagues, family members uh, to uh, brighten their brain. And we'll talk about that when we continue here on It's All in Your Head with Dr. Paul Swingle on CFUN 1410 AM. Thanks for joining us on this Remembrance Day 2007. It's all in your head with Dr. Paul Swingle on CFUN 1410 AM. Excellent phone calls again today at 280-CFUN, 280-2386. Still time for yours. Our topic is age-related declines. And Dr. Swingle headed up the Faculty of Child Psychology at the University of Ottawa prior to lecturing in psychiatry at Harvard for seven years. Now he's in Vancouver and is one of the leaders in North America in the field of biofeedback and neurotherapy. He's made it his life's passion and has helped a lot of people uh, with all sorts of different kinds of conditions, which you can find, by the way, at swingleandassociates.com. We're talking about age-related declines today, and uh, this is uh, probably a familiar refrain, but you mentioned the family member bringing in uh, an elderly uh, relative who is forgetful or is leaving the stove on. How precisely can you tell whether it's uh, an age-related decline or Alzheimer's, which is a disease, which, of course, is a a terrible disease? And is there a difference? Usually, uh, you can tell a difference between an age-related decline, uh, dementia, and Alzheimer's. Uh, There are a number of uh, characteristics uh, that uh, often distinguish uh, the two. The uh, treatment of uh, non-Alzheimer's uh, dementia, uh, of course, is more successful than Alzheimer's dementia. With Alzheimer's, it depends on how uh, far along the, uh, the person is. In the early phases, uh, neurotherapy can make quite a difference. In the later phases, we can get some minor gains. I mean, that's it in a nutshell. Uh, and the other uh, uh, one of the other conditions that I, I like to talk about when we talk about age-related declines is what I call iatrogenic 
Alzheimer's. <laughs> uh, basically, this is Alzheimer's that's caused by people trying to treat a condition that doesn't exist. So, for example, a uh, an elderly person may start to have a bit of a sleep issue, or they may be very fearful. We had a call previously of uh, an elderly person who's starting to become very suspicious and fearful. 81-year-old woman, yeah. Now, under those fearful conditions, you're likely to get some stress-related or sleep-related declines. Now, if that person is medicated for those very often the side effect of the medication given for these anxiety or sleep-related issues is memory problem. Hmm. Now, uh, uh, the individual is uh, brought in to my clinic, and uh, they're very concerned about the memory loss, so the anxiety level increases because of the fear associated with the memory loss caused by the medication for treating some other condition. And the response to that in conventional treatment is to increase the medication, which increases the, and you kind of get the picture. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> what I like to do is uh, we find out where in the brain the, the problems reside, and often it's a sleep or stress-related issue. We take care of that, titrate them off the medication, and uh, you see the sparkle return in the eyes, and it's wonderful. What is the classic, I mean, uh, because Alzheimer's, I mean, it is a disease and it's, it's prevalent. Mm. What is the classic early symptom uh, that, that maybe it's time to just come to the clinic and make sure and have a brain map done and, and make sure that it is or it isn't? The, anytime you're faced with something that looks like depression, mm. Uh, I would re I would act on that, and uh, the symptoms of depression are not only sadness, uh, but it's apathy, lack of interest in things, low energy levels, uh, sleep disturbance, things of that nature. We have a lot of evidence to indicate that these are early signs of uh, potential dementias or Alzheimer's. Uh, for example, uh, individuals that have uh, blood markers of inflammation, uh, people who have a history of herpes simplex, you know, cold sores, mm -hmm. uh, individuals who have early history of depression, all of those correlate uh, with the onset of dementia and Alzheimer's dementia. So if you address these things when they start to emerge, and correct the brain activity associated with it. Now, here's where the strength of neurotherapy comes in as opposed to medicating a problem. If you medicate that problem, you're not correcting the brain activity associated with it. What you're doing is making the person feel better <coughs> chemically. Mm. Now, uh, there are side effects associated with the medication, and there are uh, causal uh, relationships associated with the brain condition and later onset of these dementias. So it makes infinitely good sense to correct and normalize brain activity once you get these signals that something's going on. And it all starts with a phone call and a visit at 608-0444, 608-0444 for Swingle and Associates on Melville Street downtown. Uh, swingleandassociates.com is the website. Uh, the initial uh, brain mapping session doesn't take that long, really, 10 to 15 minutes or so, and mm -hmm. then you'll have a, uh, some values. You'll tell the client exactly why, why they're there, which is always a, quite a revelation. And, uh, and then from there, you know exactly how to treat. You had some excellent uh, tips on, uh, on how to, well, maybe not ward off dementia, but uh, to keep your brain sharp. And some of it's involving diet and some of it's involving exercise. And I thought you might want to pass those along because uh, they, they're surprising, actually, how, you know, how helpful that can be. Well, again, we have very good research on this. Uh, the first is that expert knowledge uh, and, and what I mean by that is somebody who has developed a skill and they developed it to a very high level. Uh, that uh, is related to delay of cognitive decline, age-related cognitive decline. That res research was done on pilots and pilots that had the highest FAA uh, proficiency ratings versus pilots that had low proficiency and the onset of age-related declines. 
perfectly obvious in the research. That was just reported in Neurology, the journal Neurology in 2007 by Dr. Taylor out of Stanford. Uh, Pain, uh, exercise, uh, individuals who have a good exercise program, age-related decline associated with increase in pain is... uh, 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 reduced, and not only is the pain reduced, but the cognitive deficiency associated with increasing pain. Uh, everybody is aware of the fact that it, when you're in pain, you seem less sharp. Mm-hmm. Okay, so you're getting a benefit of both improved uh, pain tolerance and improved cognitive functioning. <clears throat> uh, the Exercise affects the frontal cortex, and the more exercise you have, the brighter and more plastic the brain. Now, the the linkage is we've talked a lot here about brain plasticity. The reason we're able to change brain activity, even in the aged or even with brain damage, is because the brain is plastic. That is, you can get other areas of the brain to assume responsibility for activities. You get more dendritic growth and so forth. Exercise increases brain plasticity. So the brain is more capable of change. So that's the linkage that takes place. So that's the issue associated with exercise. With diet, you want the Mediterranean diet. And in a nutshell, as everybody I think knows, that's high fruit and vegetable consumption, fish consumption, very low consumption of red meat, olive oil. Uh, we also know that omega-3, now I'm not talking about 3, 6, 9 or any of these combinations. It's straight omega-3. <clears throat> slows the progression of Alzheimer's mm. and also uh, correlates well with, uh, uh, with reduced uh, risk of dementia. Uh, all of this is research that uh, has been published in you know Journal of Neurology and uh, uh, the rheumatology journals and so forth. Now, another thing that I often recommend, in addition to omega-3 supplements, is L-lysine. Now, L-lysine is an amino acid, and it's the, what people uh, may recognize is that's often used for people that have cold sores, Mm -hmm. herpes simplex. We know that there's a correlation between herpes simplex and Alzheimer's. So, if you take uh, L-lysine preventatively, it could have a very positive effect not only on the herpes simplex, but also on those uh, blood markers that I was talking about earlier, the inflammation markers, because there is a, there are some antiviral uh, uh, benefits of uh, L-lysine because herpes, of course, is a viral infection. Mm. So these are kind of things that we recommend to people to... Uh, uh, just do some things that make good sense health-wise and uh, you know, then uh, do a brain assessment, brighten the brain, get everything normalized. We'll talk about brightening the brain in just a second. Just getting back to your level of interest when you have a, mm. uh, a something of interest to you. Mm. Uh, are we talking about things like uh, chess, puzzles, uh, Sudoku? Uh, what, what kind of hobbies like painting? What kind of things are we talking about? <clears throat> We're talking about passions. Mm-hmm. An individual who really likes stamp collecting, for example, or really likes to play chess, or really likes the puzzles, okay? So we're talking about a passion level here. Right. Uh, Any kind of cognitive activity is helpful. The third is interaction with individuals. Compelling amount of evidence to suggest that uh, interacting Within, I'm not talking about sitting in a nursing home, you know, in a group of 12. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the conversation with other individuals, other individuals who have passionate interests in things. Because interacting with somebody requires that you use all your faculties. You have to listen, process, understand, then respond, listen, process, understand, and so forth. What I would stay away from is TV. TV is a killer for the elderly, mm-hmm. just like it is for kids. Keeps me in business, and it will increase, uh, uh, decrease the amount of uh, 
uh, cognitive processing that's taking place. And in my judgment, it uh, accelerates uh, age-related declines. The same is true with video games, anything of that nature. And how many uh, elderly people or, you know, our parents do we know that have the TV on as soon as they get up in the morning That's until right. as soon as they turn it off. Very interesting. We'll talk uh, just a quick, briefly bit about uh, age-related decline and your book coming out uh, in just a moment when we wrap things up with Dr. Paul Swingle on It's All in Your Head. You're listening to CFUN 1410 AM. We've had lots of great phone calls today. Thank you for uh, your questions to Dr. Paul Swingle from Swingle and Associates on Melville Street in downtown Vancouver. The telephone number is 604-608-0444. And if you want to follow up or if you have any further questions, by all means, uh, call his clinic. You're closed tomorrow, I'm assuming. Yes. Okay. Tuesday morning, 608 608- 0444 and visit the website swingleandassociates.com you can listen to past shows uh, that Dr. Swingle has had here on CFUN there as well and uh, very exciting about your book coming out very soon and uh, this is there's two, there's two books you have one for people like uh, myself and uh, our listeners and you have one for the, the medical practitioners the, the general practitioners uh, tell us about the one that's coming out for the public uh, that's Published by uh, University of Rut- uh, Rutgers University Press, <clears throat> and it's written for a parent who has a child with ADD, for example, uh, and wants to know what we do and how to monitor what we're doing, and some uh, explanation of how it works and case studies and so forth. Uh, individuals who have depression and want to correct the depression <clears throat> neurologically as opposed to masking it uh, with uh, antidepressants. So it covers a very wide range of disorders <clears throat> and how we treat them uh, with neurotherapy. And the title of the book is Biofeedback for the Brain. And then you have one for GPs to hopefully get them to start referring their clients instead of putting them on the medications to referring them to their local neurotherapist. Yes, we have one that's, uh, the pra- the title of it is The Practice of Neurotherapy, and it's really for the primary care practitioner, which could be a general practitioner, physician, naturopath, psychologist, uh, and it uh, deals with uh, basic uh, neurotherapy so that, as you say, somebody come in with depression or a sleep disturbance, they do a bit of neurotherapy as opposed to medicating the problem. Interesting uh, that it, 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 I mean, I think it's starting to catch on, and uh, I mean, that's one of the reasons why you do this program. Obviously, you're extremely busy, um, and I don't want to dwell on wait lists, but I mean, you have so many people that uh, there is a wait list. How long is it, uh, do you know? It's about, uh, it's only about two and a half months. <clears throat> We've just added uh, a number of uh, people to our clinic, so we have a staff of 11. Wow. Uh, <clears throat> it's funny that my cousin runs a, a school for troubled boys in mm-hmm. uh in new mexico and they adopted a, a kid from liberia which is a, a terribly war-torn country mm-hmm. and he was an orphan and uh, he's now into his teens and and they do neurotherapy they've got a neurotherapist on site for his separation anxiety i'm not sure if that was the exact term that he used mm-hmm. but but obviously it is you know it's starting to catch on people are starting to learn about it more but you say and you've you've said it before you got to make sure that uh, if you are going to a neurotherapist that they have other tools apart from just knowing the the practice well the problem we're facing is that there are franchises developing a one-size-fits-all and the qualifications are a warm blood and a checkbook to become a neurotherapist you know the clients uh, when you go in make sure that the person is a registered psychologist or a physician so that uh, they have other tools and they have a broader knowledge of what it is you're dealing with somebody who uh, learns a few things to uh, uh, use one size fits all to treat depression doesn't have a clue what depression really is in terms of the various manifestations and other options that you have for treating depression and so it's not only neurotherapy I mean there's some cognitive behavioral techniques that are extremely powerful and because uh, you are registered and members of your clinic are registered uh, that then qualifies for uh, some extended benefits when oh, yes. you're going to pay for it mm-hmm. uh, extended benefits and tax deduction for uh, those that aren't Yes, uh, it is covered by extended medical, and what isn't covered by extended medical is a tax-deductible medical expense because we're registered psychologists. Now, when you come back in a month, we're going to talk about something that uh, well, a lot of parents are facing right now, and that is autistic children and Asperger's. Mm-hmm. What, what exactly are, is Asperger's, very quickly? 
Uh, Asperger's differs a bit from autism in the sense that uh, the Asperger's child is aware of the other individual as a social being. Uh, they just lack the uh, development in the area of the brain associated with social skills and so forth. So there are some important differences between autism and Asperger's, although they're all considered on the uh, autism spectrum disorder. Thanks very much for all the information on age-related declines. We'll see you in a month, and uh, we'll end with your favorite song from Louis Armstrong, It's a Wonderful World. Thanks.